Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel. And if you're new to my channel, hello, my name is Gabby and welcome. If you've never been here before, have no idea what I do here on my channel. I cover true crime cases and all the cases that I cover are a little bit more on the vintage side. They're all basically 20 years or older. So if that's something that you might be interested in, maybe go down below, click that subscribe button. Also, make sure to turn on the post notifications so you can be notified every time that I upload. Now, if you are not new here, you already know that October here on this channel is oldies October, meaning that every single case that I cover during the entire month of October is really, really old. It's like ancient. Okay, not ancient, but it, they're, they're pretty old. They've, they've been around for a while. We're talking decades and decades old. But before we get into today's case, I do have to say that today's video is sponsored and it is sponsored by the undeniably incredible company that I love so much, Magellan TV. If you are a regular viewer of my channel, then you may be familiar with this service. Magellan TV is a streaming service with over 3,000 documentaries and docuseries from some of the best filmmakers and networks from all around the world. They have a ton of different genres, but of course the true crime section is my favorite, and they add crazy 15 to 20 hours of new content every single week so us fans will never run out of content to watch and this content can be viewed anywhere or anytime it's compatible with most devices so you don't have to worry about that my recommendation from magellan tv this time because i always have a little recommendation for you all is a series called lady killers with martina cole lady killers with martina cole it is a six episode series and the title kind of gives it away but true crime writer martina cole dives into the stories of female serial killers. A few of the serial killers I had heard of, like the notorious Elizabeth Bathory, we all know about her. She was accused of torturing and murdering women and girls, hundreds of them back in the late 1500s and early 1600s. Then there's an episode on Rosemary West who worked with her husband Fred. We might have heard of this one before. They also tortured and murdered women and girls but a different time period being in the 70s and 80s. But there were a couple of episodes on there about female serial killers. I had never heard of myself and this is like what I do, I like research in cases. I definitely suggest checking this series out because it doesn't just go over the cases themselves, but it also dives into a little bit of the psychology behind why a woman serial killer is so much more shocking compared to a male serial killer. It's very interesting. If you want to check out that series or thousands of other documentaries and docu-series, you can start your one month free trial by going to try.magellantv.com slash gabulosis or click the link in the description of today's video. Thank you Magellan for sponsoring yet again another one of my videos and with all that being said, let's get right to the case. Now, today's case, the one that we are diving into for the second video of Oldies October this year. If you were a member of my Patreon, if you were a patron of mine, you may remember this case. I did it in podcast form on my channel there on Patreon a few years back, but I really wanted to share it here on my YouTube channel eventually, and I felt like this is the perfect time. I don't even know how to describe this case, and I'm sure that coming up with a title for this video is going to be very hard because there's so many different aspects to it but today we are going to be discussing the very hmm, attention grabbing case of the lady of the lake lake crescent is a beautiful crystal clear lake in olympic national park in clallam county in washington state it's about 17 miles from port angeles on u.s route 101. lake crescent is the second deepest lake in the state of washington lake chelan being the first and its maximum depth is 624 feet according to wikipedia as for length it is about 12 miles across and it is a weird shape. You, you can't deny that Lake Crescent is a strange shape and am I wrong or does the east side of it not look like a deer head, right? Am I right? I was like, that looks like a deer head. 
I don't know, it's weird. Anyways, other than it being very deep and an odd shape, it's also very old. Late Crescent was formed when huge glaciers carved valleys during the last ice age, and then it filled with water about 8,000 years ago during a landslide, so it's been around for a while. Now, Lake Crescent, it's stunning. It's a beautiful place, but like so many gorgeous places out there, it has a gruesome history. According to MyOlympicPark.com, there is a spine-shivering legend surrounding the lake as well. As this legend goes, a devastating battle took place under Mount Storm King, which is a mountain sitting at the south side of the lake. The mountain apparently became very upset, broke off a chunk from its peak, and threw it down on all participating in this battle below. This chunk supposedly killed all on the battlefield and cursed the lake forever. To some out there, this may sound like a silly tale, a dark, tale passed down from generation to generation, but many locals and especially Native Americans truly believed this legend. They didn't want to go anywhere near this cursed lake, but I mean, like, was it really cursed? Did it really have bad luck? Well, two fishermen in 1940, they just might agree. I mean, they're not around in today's time, we can't ask them, but they might agree. Louis Rolf and his brother were out fishing on July 6th of the year 1940. It was a normal fishing day, nothing out of the ordinary happened until it got a little later. And all of a sudden they spot something strange over in the distance. It's just, it's bobbing up and down, up and down, up and down. They go check it out. What is it? Well, if you're here watching this video, you probably already know it's a body. It was the lifeless body of a young woman. She was wearing a green dress and wrapped in two striped blankets. Apparently, as the legend goes, I read from a few sources that Lake Crescent, it never gives up its dead. It never reveals those who have passed away and may be submerged in its waters, but this time it did. The fishermen, they immediately run as fast as they can to get help. They go to the dock of the Washington State Trout Hatchery and end up speaking with the superintendent there. His name was A.D. Immenroth, and he basically tells the fishermen that it's, it's not a body. Well, I mean, it is a body, but he thought it was the body of a deer. He thought it was just a deer. Now, they're trying to convince him, you know, this is not a deer. This, this is this is a young woman and she's wearing a green dress. I mean, I don't know what deers are going around wearing green dresses, but there could be some, but this is not. It's not a deer in a green dress. It's a woman. He decides to go back to the location with the boys and check it out though, see what they saw. When they get to the area, he quickly realizes that this is no deer in a green dress wrapped in two blankets. The boys were right. It was the body of a young woman. Immenroth immediately rushes back to contact someone higher up for help. He gets in contact with Ralph Smythe, who is the Clallam County Prosecutor Coroner, and he also gets in contact with the local sheriff named Charlie Kemp. They then all work on trying to get the woman's body out of the lake. It was pretty obvious very quickly to all that this woman had not been in the lake simply like overnight or a few days. She had been in the lake for a while, possibly years. Now we've discussed quite a few cases on my channel of remains being found in water. This is nothing new to this channel, but the condition her body was in will give you goosebumps. And that is kind of what makes this story the story. <sighs> For one, this woman, she was like porcelain, like a porcelain doll almost. Her skin was just so white. It was almost see-through. It was like snow and there was no smell, no extreme decay, only really to her face. And she wasn't bloated like a normal body submerged in water would be, nothing like that. And she had ultimately saponified if you have no idea of what that means, it, it basically means that the cold of the water of the lake had stopped decomposition and the salt and calciums in the water of the lake penetrated her fat. And it pretty much, as they described it, turned the fat on her 
body into a soap-like substance. Think about that for a minute. The doctors who saw her corpse basically called her remains an ivory soap corpse. One doctor claimed that they never saw a corpse like hers before, that her skin was almost waxy. Her remains were also called a scientific ghost story. An autopsy was conducted and they did find a cause of death. Her cause of death was strangulation, but she had also been beaten. This poor woman was a homicide victim. She hadn't just drowned in the lake and was simply found years later. Someone killed her, someone took her life. It was discovered that after she was killed, she had been hogtied and her body was weighed down with rocks and she was thrown into the lake and whoever threw her into the lake definitely hoped that she would never float to the top, but she did. The ropes that were used to tie her body to the weight had decayed over time and she floated to the top to ultimately be found by those two fishermen that day. It was estimated that she had most likely been in the water for about three years. They thought about three years, give or take. They determined that her height was about five feet, six inches tall, and she probably weighed no more than 140 pounds while she was alive. They also guessed that she was probably in her mid thirties. Although her body was well preserved, her face was not. It had undergone a bit of decomposition and because she had been in the water for so long, there was no way for them to get fingerprints from her fingers. At the very beginning, they did keep hitting dead ends when it came to identifying her, but everyone working on the case was determined to find out who this woman was, to eventually give this Jane Doe her name back. Now, there was a very brief time where people working on the case and people in that community thought that the Jane Doe could have been a woman named Marion Frances Steffens, who had gone missing in Olympic National Park in 1939. Marion was eventually ruled out as being the Jane Doe when they discovered Marion had a fractured neck vertebrae before she went missing, and this Jane Doe did not have that type of injury. Months passed by, and this Jane Doe, she would end up being buried in an unmarked grave in a potter's field near Port Angeles. Many theories came and went. Some people's determination for finding out her identity fizzled out, but some kept going and trying harder and harder to solve this mystery. This woman, she she most likely had a family and people who loved her, and they were probably wondering what happened to her. This Jane Doe's identity would be discovered after about 14 months through dental records. There have been cases before where killers have literally removed their victim's teeth so their victims couldn't be identified that way, but thankfully she had, her, had all her teeth and Without her teeth, they may have never found out who she was, or at least not until many years later. So, I don't know, like, yay, teeth. (laughs) A new investigator started working on this case, and this investigator's name was Hollis B. Foltz. Hollis started looking at people who went missing around that area and pinned in on one person, a woman who went missing from that area in the year 1937. It was hard to tell because the Jane Doe's face was decayed a bit, but her hair was spot on. It was the same color. It was mainly the teeth though that would end up matching up. The Jane Doe had a distinct bridge in her mouth of six teeth, a six tooth bridge, and it was made of beaten gold. A photo of this bridge was sent to thousands and thousands of dentist's office. A dentist in Folkton, South Dakota was basically like, hey, you know, I recognize that bridge. I did that exact bridge for a woman years back. The woman he did that work on years back just so happened to be the woman who went missing in that area in 1937. They exhumed the Jane Doe's remains and she was identified, yes, as the woman who vanished in 1937 and the woman who had the work done by the dentist in Fulton, South Dakota years before. The Lady of the Lake was positively identified as Hallie Illingworth. Hallie Illingworth was born Hallie Brooks Latham to parents Finnis and Mary Latham in Greenville, Muhlenberg County, Kentucky on January 7th of the year 1901. Now, not a whole lot is known about Hallie's early life, but we do know a little bit about her life 
during the few years leading up to her murder. At some time during her life, she made her way more west in the United States. She was very young at the time when she did this, like late teenage years. It was said that she was the type of person who definitely enjoyed change and she kind of had that the grass is greener on the other side type mentality, if that makes sense. She was definitely someone who liked to keep moving every few years or so and she really thought that the more that she moved west, like the better her life would be. Well, we do know that she married a man named Floyd in 1919 while in South Dakota. She moved to South Dakota sometime in her late teenage years and at this time she would have been about 18 years old. Based on records, they did have a daughter together but not much is set online in regards to their daughter, but the two would end up divorcing. Then she married a man named Donald in 1932. Some sources say 1933, but somewhere in that time. This was also in South Dakota. Then she made her way to Washington State after that marriage ended in divorce, and this was around 1934. When it comes to Hallie, of course, I don't know her personally. She passed away many, many years ago, but it seemed like she was the person from everything that I read that she liked being with somebody. She liked having a companion. She was kind of like a hopeless romantic. She loved to love. She liked seeing who was out there. She wanted to settle down. She wanted to be married. She wanted that lifestyle, but unfortunately, you know, two times before she had married the wrong person, things didn't work out. But in those relationships, from what I read online, it didn't really seem like there was any abuse. There was just differences. Things just didn't go right in those relationships. And unfortunately, they ended in divorce and divorce at the time was very frowned upon. So I think that after the second divorce, she just wanted to up, leave, move to a new state and kind of start new. And people around her definitely thought that she was probably gonna take this period of time to just focus on herself and, you know, get things situated in her life. But within pretty much no time after moving to Washington, she would meet a new love interest. She would go on to meet her third husband, who would be her third husband, a man named Montgomery J. Illingworth, or Monty as most people called him. Monty, he was a beer salesman, a beer truck driver, and I will not sugarcoat things, Monty was not a good dude. He was definitely not a Prince Charming. He is not Prince Charming in this story by any means. Hallie and Monty, they met because Hallie was a barmaid at a tavern called Lake Crescent Tavern. They ended up marrying in Seattle in 1936 and their relationship was insanely rocky from the start. Only about five months into their marriage, police had to break up an argument between them because it got so bad. Monty was said to be extremely abusive towards Hallie, and there's different ways of being abusive. There's emotionally abusive, mentally abusive, physically abusive. It seemed like he was all three, especially physically abusive. Hallie would show up to work covered in bruises on multiple different occasions. And it was obvious to the people around her that she was in an abusive relationship, but nobody really knew what to do about it. It was also said that most of Hallie and Monty's fights revolved around Monty's alcoholism and inability to stay loyal to his wife. So obviously when it was discovered that the lady of the lake was Hallie Illingworth, that she had been murdered, they looked at the person who looked the most suspicious, her disgustingly abusive husband, Monty. They tracked him down. He was living in Long Beach, California with his new wife, Eleanor. Eleanor Pearson was her name. They arrested him on October 24th of 1941 and he was taken into custody by Los Angeles Sheriff's deputies. I also have to mention that Eleanor, she 
based on what was said online, I can't verify this, but it was said that Eleanor was Hallie's sister's roommate. Which, I mean, kind of think about that. Like, your, your roommate, your roommate's sister went missing and you're gonna get with the husband? I am in no way trying to shame a woman, but I'm saying as a woman, if I met somebody and his wife had just recently went missing and it was known by people that he was abusive, that's like a super red flag. I don't think Eleanor, I don't know if she knew what red flags were, but that's a red flag. But maybe Eleanor was wearing kind of like rose colored glasses because it was said that Monty was a ladies man, that he was definitely the type of person who could manipulate women. And maybe instead of her finding suspicion in that, maybe she was kind of sympathetic or empathetic towards him and tried to feel for him because his wife had gone missing and nobody knew what happened. You know, maybe it was that sort of situation. So I can't, we can't really judge. Back to Monty though, they began questioning him about his marriage to Hallie, what happened around her disappearance and what happened after. Over time, some things may get distorted, but we do know that Hallie went missing on December 22nd of 1937. That was the last time that anyone saw her. When she went missing, Monty supposedly told everybody that Hallie had ran away with a man from Alaska. That's what he apparently told everyone. And from my research, it doesn't really seem like anybody in Hallie's family or any of her friends really started trying to investigate on their own what happened to her. I think maybe they just didn't really believe that she just ran off with somebody from Alaska, but maybe they thought that she just ran off because she was somebody who kind of liked to move to different places. But it seemed like they didn't question it too much. Maybe they just thought that she would, you know, come back eventually. I don't think any of them really thought that she had been murdered by Monty. Anyways though, since Monty said that she ran off with another man, he was granted a divorce from Hallie. Basically no questions asked. And within no time, he was getting cozy with Eleanor, who, like I said, was Hallie's sister's roommate. He was extradited back to Port Royal, Washington for the trial, which began on February 24th of 1942. And he of course pleaded not guilty but not only did he plead not guilty, but he also stood by the claim that the Jane Doe was not actually Hallie. He was saying that Hallie was still alive out there, but they proved that to be you know, untrue through dental records in court. Before, when Monty told what happened to Hallie, he was always sticking by his claim that she ran off with a man to Alaska. In court though, it was a little bit different. In court, he said that the morning of Wednesday, December 22nd, 1937, Hallie went to work just like any other day. He said that when she got home from work, they got into another heated argument and that he left their home and went downtown. He said that when he got back home, she was gone and that he never saw her again. The end, that's what he claimed to happen. They did bring up the topic of abuse quite a bit in the courtroom though. And Monty was basically saying that he never beat her, that things did get physical between them at times, but she would also hit him. It doesn't matter because people who worked with her vouched that that woman had bruises on her many times when she showed up to work. They would end up asking him why he hated his wife. They literally asked him that in court in which he claimed that he didn't and that he did not kill her, that it wasn't him. Well, you know how it was her teeth that ultimately helped them identify her? Well, it would be the rope that was used to tie her up. That would be what helped solve her case in full. 
It's very interesting how this all panned out, so keep on listening. A storekeeper near the lake remembered a beer salesman who came in once to borrow 50 feet of rope, rope that the storekeeper used to tie up boats. The man who came in, aka Monty, said that he needed the rope so he could pull his vehicle out of some mud. Well, he was supposed to just borrow this rope. He never paid for it. He was just going to borrow it, but it was never returned. They ended up comparing the rope that was used to tie up Hallie and tie her to the weights and everything to the rope that the storekeeper had, and it was the exact same rope. They compared the fibers from the longer rope it was cut from, and it was a match. It was the same same rope. Guess how many hours it took jurors to come forward with a verdict? Four hours. It only took them four hours. On March 5th of the year 1942, Montgomery J. Illingworth was found guilty of the murder of Hallie Brooks Latham Illingworth. He received what was supposed to be life in prison, and you're probably like, you know, woo, justice was served. No, because he was paroled nine years later and then moved back to California and lived out the rest of his life until he died on November 5th of 1975. So in this case, justice was kind of served. Now there are really not a lot of photos of Monty online, but here's one I found. Here's one of him with his mother who is kissing him on the cheek and of course believed that her son was innocent and his wife, Eleanor. It is believed that the murder was not premeditated and that the rope was actually used to pull his vehicle out of the mud and that he just kind of kept it to the side. And then a fight broke out that night, like he said, but things went too far and he ended up strangling her to death and then he didn't really know what to do. And then he wrapped up her body in a blanket, put it in his vehicle, drove around for a while, and then decided to dump her remains in Lake Crescent. They figured that he drove the vehicle to Lake Crescent, put her body in a rowboat, rode it to what he figured would be over the deepest part of the lake, threw her in it after, of course, weighing her body down, and then drove off and left. But there was a lot of word going around the courtroom though that Paul Monty did not work alone. That after he killed her, he possibly reached out to what he figured was a trustworthy friend to help him get rid of her body, but this was never proven. He was the only person that was ever charged in this case. And if anyone did help him, they definitely did not tell anyone. And it definitely wasn't a deathbed confession because that never came forward. And there was a little bit of talk that he had gotten rid of Hallie to be with Eleanor and that possibly Eleanor knew about what happened and knew about his plan, but that was never proven either. That was just kind of like a rumor that was going on. You also might be wondering because it was a rope, it was kind of like a thick rope that was used to tie her up and tie her to the weights and everything. You know, how would it decay in water in just a few years? Well, apparently it was like the right levels of calciums in the water that helped break down the rope over time and that the rope, you know, decayed and she was able to float to the top. Now, I'm not a scientist, I don't know, but that's that's what I read. That was the explanation that I read for that. And that isn't where I'm going to end this case just yet. I normally would not include, I guess you would put it like paranormal aspects to cases, even though I love diving into the paranormal myself, but sometimes it's a lot of, you know, just word, but because it is, Halloween, I figured I would include this part as well. The place that she worked, Lake Crescent Tavern, would later be named Lake Crescent Lodge, and that's what it's still called in today's time. And there have been dozens and dozens of people who have visited the lodge and claim to have seen the ghost of Hallie. Some say they have seen her in passing, some say they have seen her in 
an area in the lodge sitting and smoking a cigarette. Some say they have even spoken to her spirit. And it isn't just guests, but also people who work at the lodge as well. So yes, there are people that visit the lodge, work at the lodge, that even some people without knowing the story of what happened claimed that they have seen a woman that looks just like Hallie and that she'll be wearing a green dress and she'll be in a certain location. I don't know, it's very interesting. But that all in all is the case of the Lady of Crescent Lake. And if you thought that that was the end of the video, no, I'm not letting you all go just yet because I'm gonna drag this out a little longer. There's an entirely other case connected to this lake as well. And if we're talking about Lake Crescent, there's no way that I can talk about Lake Crescent and do a video about Lake Crescent without involving this case because it's also very interesting. This case happened in 1929, years before Hallie's case. On July 3rd of the year 1929, married couple Russell Warren and Blanche Warren, they were making their way home from Port Angeles, Washington. Russell had apparently picked up his wife from the hospital. It's really unknown why she was there, but it was a little bit of a stay for her. And they had supposedly picked up a washing machine and some groceries and they were heading home. They had their two sons waiting for them at home at their cabin. One of the sons was 12 years old and the other was 14 years old. They were driving their 1927 Chevrolet and taking US Route 101, which runs right near Lake Crescent, and they never made it home. Family had no idea what happened to them, and through the years, people were starting to think that they simply abandoned their boys. Their two boys, these two boys, they grew up wanting the case to be solved so bad because they knew in their hearts that their parents would never have just left them. But there were cruel people who would bring it up to them and kids who would tease them about it saying that the boys weren't wanted by their mother and father. And it was really horrible. Apparently there was a pretty windy road that led to the family's cabin. So originally people thought maybe they drove off the road, but their car was never found. Then some thought that possibly their car had swerved off of the highway and went into Lake Crescent. But for decades, there were sweeps done of the lake and, and divers went searching for the car and they never found anything. It was really a mystery for decades and decades and decades of what happened to the Warrens. In the year 2001, a former diver named Bob he was insistent on finding out what happened to the Warrens and he truly felt that their car had to be in the lake, but it just wasn't found yet. He was in contact with a ranger at the Olympic National Park and this ranger's name is Dan and Bob, he's getting on Dan about finding the car. He's very persistent. And Dan, he wants to find out this mystery as well. So they looked through information about the wreck from back in 1929, and it suggested that the Warren's car wrecked at a certain point called Madrona Point. Well, on a map of the area, there's no Madrona Point, but near a point called Meldrum Point, near mile marker 223, there was a Madrone tree. So they look near this area and they end up locating the car in the water right off of like this cliff area in 2002. And they end up finding out that this car that they located in the water is the Warren's car. And two years after they find the car, they end up locating a bone. It's a femur bone, a human femur bone. It was quite a long femur bone and they thought, well, you know, Russell Warren was quite tall, so this femur bone may be his. They take the bone in for some examining and yes, it's a human bone. They extract DNA from it, find a living relative of Russell Warren, compare DNA directly to this living relative in 2005, and it was a match. The Warrens never left their sons behind. They swerved off the road and didn't make it out of the water back in 1929 on their way home. Which is just crazy to think about that the case was finally solved so many years later. But to make the story even a little bit more eerie because that's what I'm here to do, the Warrens, they had two sons, like I said. Their names were Charles and Frank. 
1964, Charles was on his boat and all of a sudden a fisherman in the distance hears a huge boom, like the sound of a collision, something colliding, boats colliding. The next day, a transom from Charles' boat was found just floating in the water left behind. But there was also timber left behind as well that had Japanese writing on it. So a theory developed that Charles' boat was hit by a Japanese freighter. So just like his parents, Charles died in the water, but his remains have never been located. And poor Frank, he died pretty young as well. He died of alcoholism and his daughter basically said that Frank also died of drowning, but a different type of drowning. It was drowning of the liver as she called it. There is just so much sadness surrounding this lake. Okay, like another thing to add on top of everything else, remember how I said that they found the Warren's car near Meldrum Point? Well, Meldrum Point is also referred to as Ambulance Point because in the 1960s, an ambulance flew into the water at that exact point. The people in the front of the ambulance made it out of the ambulance, but the poor guy in the back who was an injured logger, he did not. I'm telling it, that there is something about this lake. The list of unfortunate tales surrounding this lake go on and on, but those are the ones that I just wanted to share and talk about in today's video. Now, I don't know about you, but I do believe that an area can be breathtakingly beautiful and uh, people can have great and good memories there, but it can also harbor some very bad energy. And that's kind of how I would describe Lake Crescent. But thank you for taking a little bit of time out of your day to hear about these stories. And I find them fascinating. I hope you did as well. And if you have any thoughts about any of the tales or cases that I presented in today's video, definitely leave those thoughts any of those comments down below in the comments section. But with all that being said, I hope you all have an amazing rest of your day. I'm hoping where you are, it's either Sunday or Monday, depending what time zone you're in, because I'm really trying to start getting my videos out in the afternoon on Sundays. I'm in the Eastern time zone, I'm really shooting for like that time. We'll see how consistent I stay with it because I'm very inconsistent. I do apologize. Anyways, I will see you all in the next one.